A new episode of our podcast, Eons, Mysteries of Deep Time, is out now. In this episode, we grapple with one of the biggest open questions in paleontology. What was the first dinosaur? Check it out now, wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, I think that a lot of us tend to think about and talk about evolution in the wrong way. And hear me out, because I know I've done this for a long time, too. Like, we think of the aquatic creature climbing out of the water onto land for the first time with the benefit of bigger, stronger forelimbs. And we think of that terrible, misleading illustration, the so-called March of Progress, which gets so many things wrong, not the least of which is the idea that humans are somehow the pinnacle, the ultimate culmination of the evolutionary process. We think that evolution only goes in one direction, toward getting bigger, more advanced, and more complex. But I'm here to tell you that is not the case. Things turn out to be much more nuanced than that. And the proof is what's perhaps the most bizarre animal in the world. Yes, this is an animal. It's among the smallest and simplest animals ever found. It has no mouth, and it has no nervous system, and at least one species can't even breathe oxygen. How did this thing come to be? Well, it used to be something else, something a lot more complex, until it evolved. But in a way, that's the opposite of the way we're used to thinking. The name of this strange little animal is Mixozoan, which means slime animal. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I've been called worse. And there are more than 2,000 known species of them today. And they all make their living by being parasites. They rely on infecting hosts in order to survive. The vast majority of them have life cycles that involve alternating between infecting invertebrates, mostly annelid worms, and vertebrates, mostly fish. And while their life cycles are kind of complex, that's really the only thing about them that is. Like I said, they're incredibly small, both in terms of their physical size and in the size of their genome. For most of their life cycle, they're smaller than the width of a human hair. And one species has a genome that's a contender for the smallest animal genome ever known. And they're missing some of the most basic features that we associate with animals, like a mouth, a gut, a nervous system, and true gametes, egg or sperm cells. This level of simplicity is why mixes Zoans were grouped together with single-celled protozoa for more than a century after they were discovered in 1838. But over time, we began to realize that this classification just couldn't be right. For one thing, mixozoans aren't single-celled, at least not all the time. At certain points in their complex life cycle, they're multicellular, although just barely, consisting of only a few cells at most. And as researchers dove deeper and deeper into mixozoan biology, they came to a bizarre but inescapable conclusion. Mixozoans started out much larger and more complex. Specifically, they used to look something like modern jellyfish. But then over time, they shed many of their biological components to become much smaller, simpler animals. Experts were able to figure this out because these animals still hold some clues about their evolutionary past. For example, they still have a few genes that are found only in the animals known as cnidarians, which include jellyfish, sea anemones, and corals. And an analysis of their DNA has found that mixozoans are closely related to the subgroup of cnidarians called medusozoans, aka the jellyfish. And beyond the genetic evidence, they've also kept at least one physical feature from their ancient jellyfish-like past. They have nematocysts, or stinging structures. Nematocysts are only found in cnidarians, and they use them to do things like capture prey or defend against predators. And mixozoans still have them, along with the genes and proteins needed to build and use them. But they seem to have adapted them for their parasitic lifestyle. I think it's funny that we call it a lifestyle because it's kind of a charitable way of putting it, I think. Like, Keto diet is a lifestyle. Stand-up paddling is a lifestyle. Being a parasite is like... I would classify that differently, but... They've lost the toxins that nematocysts would normally inject, so they're no longer used as stingers. Instead, they're used as anchors to help the animal attach to its host. It's one of the few physical features that they kept and adapted rather than just losing altogether. This process of simplification is sometimes known as regressive evolution, and it's actually pretty common among parasites. I mean, after all, when a species can exploit some of the features of their hosts, Many of their own features just become redundant, like nothing more than evolutionary baggage. These unnecessary features can then be lost over time, which means the animal can expend less energy and resources on them. For example, parasites often become less mobile because their hosts can move around and get them from place to place. And they have reduced sense organs because, again, the host is keeping track of their surroundings so they don't have to. But we've never seen any other group of animals go through such an extreme process of regressive evolution as the mixozoans have. I mean, at least one species of mixozoan has even lost its mitochondrial DNA, and with it, the ability to carry out aerobic respiration. That's the process of generating energy in the presence of oxygen. 
because the genes that make respiration possible are in the mitochondria. This makes it the only known animal that doesn't and physically can't use oxygen. So how do we know that these parasites are actually animals, even though they're missing so many of the hallmarks of the animal kingdom? Well, they trace their ancestry to the animal kingdom, which makes them still animals. It's kind of like how birds are still considered dinosaurs, even though they don't look much like what people picture when they hear the word dinosaur. It all comes down to a group's evolutionary history. So when did Mixozoans begin their weird evolutionary journey? Well, the fossil record of Mixozoans is basically non-existent because they're tiny and squishy. But by comparing the genes of Mixozoans with the genes of other animals, researchers could roughly calculate how long it would have taken the differences, aka mutations, to take place after they diverged from each other. And this analysis, called the molecular clock, places the origins of the group at around 650 million years ago when they last shared a common ancestor with the Medusozoans. These ancient roots make them the oldest known parasitic animals. And while they were probably more anatomically complex than they are now, their life cycles were simpler back then. Today, most Mixozoans alternate between using invertebrates and fish as hosts. But 600 million years ago, fish didn't exist yet. So scientists think that their original hosts were aquatic invertebrates, like bryozoans and annelid worms. Then, when fish arrived on the scene over 100 million years later, mixozoans began infecting them too, and they wound up with the two-host invertebrate-to-fish life cycle that most of them still have today, which probably happened independently multiple times as new groups of fish evolved. As their hosts diverged and radiated, so did the mixozoans, in a co-evolutionary dance that continues to this day. And this is probably the key to the incredible diversity of living mixozoans. The 2,000 or so species that have been described so far represent around 20% of all known cnidarians. The story of the mixozoans makes us fundamentally reconsider what it means to be an animal by showing just how unrecognizable one can become, given enough time and the right selective pressures. And it's shown us that evolving doesn't have to mean becoming bigger or more complex. Sometimes less really is more. Okay, before you go, big news for history buffs like myself. PBS Digital Studios has a new history-themed channel called PBS Origins, and we think you're gonna love it. The channel will be home to multiple shows, including a new series called Historian's Take. This show explores history through the lens of pop culture, examining what that culture can tell us about its time period and what it means for our future. PBS Origins will have even more new stuff on the way, so hit the link in the description and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. And thanks to this month's eontologists who are always with us. Callie told me that was supposed to be a parasite pun, but... Chase Archambault, Colton, Andy and Eric Higgins, John Davison Ng, Jake Hart, Maddie Ferreira, and Melanie Lamb Carnivale. By becoming an Ionite at patreon.com slash eons, you can get fun perks like submitting a joke for us to read. Uh-oh. Like this one from Jacob. How do blind megafauna read their books? They get them printed in La Braille. No. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Adam Lowe Studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more fabulous fossils.